Hello and welcome back to the Nephrology Curriculum. Today we're going to be talking about potassium disorders and in particular the clinical entities of hypo and hyperkalemia. Let's start with the physiology of potassium metabolism. So in terms of potassium intake, the average intake in a Western diet would be somewhere between 70 and 150 millimoles of potassium per day. Now you might be surprised to see where some of those highest sources of potassium are coming from. Look at avocado, for instance. One medium-sized avocado has about 38 millimoles of potassium. Tomato paste has a high amount of potassium, as well as sirloin steak and some of the meats that we ingest. Things like orange juice, potatoes, and raisins are also very high in potassium, and that becomes very important in patients who have to limit their potassium. Now, once we intake potassium through our diet, it's absorbed efficiently by the GI tract. It's then distributed into primarily the intracellular compartment. So about 98% of our potassium resides within that intracellular fluid compartment. And only 2% is actually distributed to the extracellular fluid compartment. The normal plasma potassium, that's what's in that ECF, is about 3.5 to 5.2 milliequivalents per liter. Now, our electrogenical sodium potassium ATPase drives that asymmetrical potassium distribution between that ICF and ECF. So remember that sodium potassium pump that's located at those cells. It actively transports two potassium ions into the cell in exchange for extrusion of three sodium ions into the extracellular fluid compartment. Now that maintenance of that intracellular potassium and that asymmetry between those two compartments is critical for nerve conduction and muscular contraction, so we have to have that. Now when we think about potassium balance, there's four main mechanisms that we really have to remember. Number one is the intake that we get through our diet, so what are we eating in terms of our potassium? Number two is GI losses. The GI tract is going to secrete anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of our absorbed potassium daily. But look at the renal losses. 90 to 95 percent of potassium is really regulated by the kidney. And then, of course, there's an element of transcellular potassium shift. That means that the actual potassium levels, or total body potassium, is the same, but there is a redistribution between the ICF and ECF. So, we just said that 90 to 95 percent of potassium is regulated by the kidney. Let's take a little tour through our nephron and find out how this occurs. So potassium is freely filtered at the glomerulus. About 65 percent to 70 percent of that filtered potassium is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Now when it's reabsorbed there, this is a passive transport process. It gets reabsorbed paracellularly, that means between cells, by solvent drag and diffusion. So this is as opposed or in contrast to active transport, which is what is diagrammed in my top diagram there. That's one of my proximal tubular epithelial cells, and you can see there's an ion channel and apical transport protein. When we have proteins or ions that are actually absorbed through these channels, that's an active transport process requiring energy. However, the way potassium gets reabsorbed at that proximal tubule is passive, meaning that, again, it's moving between the paracellular pathway between cells, and it's going through diffusion and solvent drag. An easy way to remember that is P, passive transport proximal tubule paracellular. Now, the next stop in our nephron that's important when it comes to potassium is the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. This area is responsible for reabsorbing about 10 to 25 percent of potassium. And it's driven by our luminal sodium potassium 2 chloride, or NKCC2, multiporter. Now, this is also the site of loop diuretics. It's an active transport process, meaning that this is actually driven by that basal lateral sodium potassium ATPase located on the right. Our transporter affinity is going to be very, very high for both sodium and potassium and have max activity when the tubular fluid concentration for sodium and potassium or below 5 to 10 milliequivalents. Now, one of the elegant things about this cell is the whole idea of potassium recycling. Potassium can actually recycle across that luminal membrane, allowing for continued activation of the NKCC2. And that makes sense to us because sodium is in much higher concentration compared to potassium. So in order for us to be able to absorb all of the sodium, we would have to recycle that potassium in order to make that transporter work.
And that's exactly what happens. The activity of that potassium channel is actually inhibited by ATP, and it allows us to link to the level of sodium reabsorption. So as more sodium enters the cell, sodium gets transported out of the cell into that paratubular capillary by that sodium potassium ATPase. That lowers the cellular ATP level, and it stimulates the activity of that luminal potassium channel, also called the renal outer medullary potassium channel. That will then allow, permit the return of reabsorbed potassium into the lumen and then further link to sodium reabsorption. So moving on from the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the next important stop is in the principal cell. Our principal cells are located in that cortical collecting duct, and they have a very important job when it comes to potassium handling. So initially, potassium is actively transported into that cell by our sodium potassium ATPase at the basal lateral membrane. It's then secreted into the tubular fluid down a favorable electrochemical gradient by luminal potassium channels in that apical membrane. And these are governed by factors that affect passotransport. So things like a concentration gradient across the luminal membrane. Think about where potassium is distributed. We just said that it's primarily in the intracellular compartment. So we have a very high amount of potassium intracellularly, a very low amount of potassium in the tubular fluid. So it will favor to move or efflux into that tubular fluid down its concentration gradient. We also have an electrical gradient here. So that is generated by reabsorption of sodium. Sodium is going to go to that epithelial sodium channel, be reabsorbed into that principal cell. When it does so, it leaves a negative charge behind because even though it's paired with sodium chloride, chloride gets reabsorbed at a later time. So that negative charge then is going to favor potassium reflux in, efflux into that tubular fluid. And finally, we have potassium permeability of those luminal membranes. So not only are those luminal membranes present, they have to be open. So with all of these together, these are some of the main regulators of potassium excretion in our principal cell. Now, there's four main factors that you really have to think about when it comes to potassium secretion at that principal cell. And I promise you, if you remember these four things, you will be able to solve any potassium problem that you are ever confronted with. The first factor that I want you to think about is aldosterone. Aldosterone, remember, is created by the zona glomerulosa in the adrenal gland. And its job with regards to potassium is going to be to augment potassium secretion from that principal cell and efflux that into the tubular fluid. It does so by a number of ways. Number one, it increases the number of open sodium channels and potassium channels in that luminal membrane. So not only are they there, they have to be open. It also enhances the activity of the sodium ATPase at that basal lateral membrane. Second factor to think about in terms of what regulates potassium efflux at the principal cell is plasma potassium. If I have a very high plasma potassium, I'm going to need to actually get rid of extra potassium. The same mechanism that applies with aldosterone is going to happen here. So high potassium levels cause patients to increase the number of open sodium and potassium channels in that luminal membrane, and it also will enhance the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase at that basal lateral membrane. Now the third factor to think about is the distal flow rate. And what that means is the flow of the tubular fluid and how fast it's moving. When you have an increase in distal flow rate or increase in tubular fluid rate, it's going to wash the secreted potassium away and replace it with relatively low potassium fluid. That's going to then favor that concentration gradient. It's going to favor potassium moving from the intracellular compartment to the tubular fluid. It's going to move down its concentration gradient. Now, when that distal flow rate is reduced, you're going to have a high luminal potassium content because of less washout and low urine flow. So less potassium is going to efflux into that tubular fluid. Now, you also, there are some other mechanisms that are at play here. There are something called maxi-K channels. These are voltage-gated channels that sense that tubular flow rate. And again, they will help in the response of potassium efflux into that tubular fluid. So, Take home point when you have a high tubular flu fluid rate. So that would be a patient who might be polyuric, meaning that they make greater than three liters of fluid. That is going to stimulate potassium secretion. When you have a low tubular fluid rate, meaning somebody who might be oliguric, they're going to have less efflux of potassium into that tubular flow rate and have a higher plasma potassium. Now, last factor to remember is distal sodium delivery. So think about what happens. When you have sodium that is presented to that principal cell, you've got entry of sodium by that epithelial sodium channel. 
that makes the lumen electronegative. Remember, sodium is going to leave behind a negative charge as it gets reabsorbed. You then have transport of sodium into the paratubular capillaries by that ATPase at the basal lateral pump, and that's going to pump more potassium into that cell. And then you have more potassium secreted into that electronegative lumen. So when we think about distal sodium delivery, that would be the mechanism by which loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics cause hypokalemia. They allow for an increase in distal delivery of sodium to this site. Our last stop in the nephron as it pertains to potassium is the alpha intercalated cell at the collecting duct. This cell is critical because it reabsorbs potassium and it does it through the apical hydrogen potassium ATPase shown here. This is an active transport process, meaning that it requires energy. So it will actively secrete protons into that tubular lumen or the tubular fluid in exchange for potassium reabsorption. The active reabsorption by that hydrogen ATPase really enables us to be able to reduce our urinary potassium excretion to less than 15 millimoles per day in severe potassium deficiency.